the topic of this session is recent encounters with the laws relating to religious freedom. Uh, and I'm going to just briefly introduce each of the presenters and then turn the time to them. And uh, I think we're in for some really great scholarship. Uh, Nathan B. Oman will be speaking on the obligation to obey the law in the Latter-day Saint tradition. Nathan is the Rita Ann Rollins Professor at, of Law at William & Mary Law School, where he teaches classes on contracts, business law, and contemporary legal theory. He has published numerous articles on Latter-day Saint legal history in Washington University Law Review, Iowa Law Review, Brigham Young University Law Review, Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, and BYU Studies Quarterly, uh, among other journals. He is currently working on a book examining legal thought and experience in the Latter-day Saint tradition. He is the editor with Samuel Brunson of Reapproaching Zion, New Essays in Mormon Social Thought. He is also the author or editor of three books and numerous articles on, and book chapters dealing with contract law and philosophy of law. He was educated here at BYU and at Harvard Law School. Uh, we'll first hear from Nathan. We'll follow the schedule that's outlined in the program. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so today I want to ask what we could think of as um, some law professor questions about the law. So um, while I hope what I'm going to say is going to be historically responsible, my primary interest is actually not in history. Rather, what I want to do is identify the ways in which Latter-day Saints have conceptualized uh, the obligation to obey the law. And I identify basically three strands in the Mormon tradition of arguments about uh, the obligation to obey the law. Uh, first is a Latter-day Saint uh, version of pro basically Protestant claims about legal authority that have their origins in the thought of Martin Luther and John Calvin. The second is a rejection of the idea of legal authority based on a pessimistic assessment of human rulers, a position that's commonly associated with St. Augustine. And finally, modern Latter-day Saints have adopted a form of what philosophers call an, an expressive theory of legal obligation. So first, at a conference held in Kirtland, Ohio in 1835, the church formally adopted a document entitled Of Governments and Laws in General, which stated, we believe that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man, and that he holds men accountable for their acts in relation to them, both in making laws and in administering them for the good and safety of society. It went on to say, we believe that all men are bound to sustain and uphold the respective governments in which they reside. The statement was likely authored by Oliver Cowdery, and it seems to have been partly an effort to allay political suspicions um, about Latter-day Saints that were prompted by sympathetic statements about abolitionism in a Mormon newspaper. In the 1830s, abolitionism was seen as a lawless and antinomian movement, and in distancing themselves from it, Latter-day Saints insisted on their allegiance to the law. More broadly, the statement was part of an effort to garner public support after the violent expulsion of the saints from Jackson County, Missouri in 1833. And it's become uh, a formally canonized uh, part of Latter-day Saint scripture uh, today as section 134 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, um, the approach taken in one, section 134 is in line with Protestant ideas that have their, ideas, their origins in the magisterial reformation. So the key scriptural texts for the Protestant reformers when it came to questions of legal obligation uh, are found in 1 Peter and in uh, Romans chapter 13. Uh, so in uh, Romans 13, 1, Paul declares, let every person be subject to the powers that be, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Um, later in the New Testament, uh, Peter writes, be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to the governors sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. So Martin Luther quotes these scriptures uh, in arguing for um, an obligation to obey the law and writes, if there were no law in human government, then seeing that all the world is evil and that scarcely one human being in a thousand is a true Christian, people would devour each other and no one would be able to support wife and children, feed himself and serve God. Likewise, John Calvin, uh, in his Institutes um, of Religion, wrote that civil magistrates have a mandate from God and have been invested with divine authority and are wholly God's representatives in manner acting as his vice regents. Calvin and Luther, however, did place some limits on secular authority. Calvin insisted that it was not right to obey rulers who commanded things that were in violation of divine law. 
Later Calvinist thinkers such as Thomas Beza, Johannes Althaeus, and John Milton expanded on this proviso in the Institutes to generate theories of, that limited government um, authority over matters of religious conscience. Now, while there's no evidence of which I'm aware that Cowdery was consciously borrowing from such thinkers, uh, Calvinist ideas permeated religious discourse in early uh, America, and Cowdery adopts a similar line of thinking. Governments are instituted by God, and the authority of their enactments rests on the authority of God. However, this authority is limited. Men are bound by the authority of the law, but only while, quote, protected in their inherent and inalienable rights by the laws of such government, while such laws hold sacred, the freedom of religious conscience. In short, section 134 is a fusion of Christian, largely Protestant theology and enlightenment conceptions of human rights of a kind that would have been very unsurprising in 19th century America. Now there's another strand, there's another strand of early Latter-day Saint thought that takes a far more critical stance towards human government. Tension between Zion building and the secular law appeared almost immediately in Latter-day Saint history. The New Jerusalem was literally to be an independent sovereign. This was coupled with expectations that the world would shortly come to an end, and the faithful who fled to Zion were to be protected as the nations of the earth failed. Hence, the legal independence of Zion would be uh, achieved through the failure of secular legal regimes. Now, the claims of what have been called Zion nationalism changed over the course of Joseph Smith's lifetime and the later 19th century. But in general, it rejected the ultimate authority of secular legal systems while seeking as much as possible to work within them. In 1845, shortly after Smith's murder, uh, his successors published what amounted to a de facto declaration of independence. So this is the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. They write, the city of Zion shall put an end to jarring creeds and political wranglings by uniting the republic, states, provinces, territories, nations, tribes, kindreds, tongues, and people, and sects. In one great common bond of brotherhood, the Lord also shall be their king and their lawgiver, and the wars will cease and peace will prevail for a thousand years. Now, these were not simply statements of rhetoric or, or uh, millennial expectations. While this document was being published, um, Brigham Young and his associates were actively planning a political independence through the Secret Council of 50. And once they were established in Utah, Brigham Young would declare that the kingdom of God circumscribes and comprehends the municipal laws for the people in their outward governments. As a practical matter, of course, the Latter-day Saints never achieved political independence. It proved impossible for them to flee beyond the expanding power of the United States. But conceptually, they thought of Zion as an independent uh, legal authority. Now, writing about a decade after Joseph Smith's uh, death, John Taylor provided the closest thing to a systematic statement of the relationship between Zion and legal authority in his book, The Government of God. Viewed in broad historical perspective, he argued, efforts at human government have failed Quote, deadly jealousies, fiendish hates, mortal combat, dying groans have filled the earth, and our bulwarks, our chronicles, our histories all bear testimony to this. And whence do these things come, he asked. The answer he gave um, was that human beings had usurped for themselves God's right to rule. He writes, if the world is to be the Lord's, he certainly has the right to govern it, for we have already stated that law has that man has no authority except that which is delegated to him. He possesses a moral power to govern his actions subject at all time to the laws of God, but never authorized to act independent of God, much less is he authorized to rule the earth without the call and direction of the Lord. Therefore, any rule or dominion over the earth which is not given by the Lord is surreptitiously obtained and never will be sanctioned by him. All secular regimes claim the right to control human beings, but this was a power that Taylor insisted could belong legitimately only to God and his agents. Human governments could not claim any inherent legitimacy. They deserved respect only insofar as they were, in their particular situation, beneficial to those over whom they presided. Now, the position articulated here by Taylor um, has deep resonances in Christian thought. In the wake of the sack of Rome, Augustine sought to refute the accusation that Christianity had caused the catastrophe by weakening the civic virtue of the Romans. Canvassing history, he concluded that cruelty, violence, and usurpation, not virtue, had been the foundation of empire. He writes in the City of God, justice removed then, what are the kingdoms but great bands of robbers? What are bands of robbers themselves but little kingdoms? 
It was a pertinent and truthful answer that was made to Alexander the Great by a pirate whom he had seized. When the king asked him what he meant by infesting the sea, the pirate defiantly replied, the same as you do when you infest the whole world. But because I do it in a little ship, I am called a robber. And because you do it in a great fleet, you are an emperor. The position articulated by Taylor sits comfortably within this skeptical tradition, granting at best contingent and provisional authority uh, to the state. Now, the Latter-day Saint tradition has not been static. And at the end of the 19th century, Latter-day Saints abandoned the dreams of Zion nationalism, and Mormonism began uh, to function uh, like another religious denomination in the United um, States. In the 20th century, um, Mormonism first emerged as another denomination, but then after World War II, it became an expanding global movement, albeit one that continued to have a sort of American flavor to it. Um, these transformations yielded a Latter-day Saint argument about legal authority, okay, that we would call, that philosophers would call an expressive uh, theory of legal authority. Now, one of the earliest discussions of legal obligation is found in Plato's Crito, where Socrates is about to be executed by the Athenian laws unjustly. And Socrates in the dialogue is explaining to his friends why it is that he submits to the authority of the Athenian laws. And the answer that he gives is that he owes a debt of gratitude to the Athenian laws because the Athenian laws are what made him who he was by providing for his family and his education. And in order to discharge this debt of gratitude, he is required to express gratitude to his native city. And the way he expresses that gratitude is by obeying the law. So he has an obligation to express something. And the way he discharges that obligation of expression is through legal obedience. Now, Latter-day Saints have a similar argument um, uh, or set of reasons that we've used um, uh, since World War II in particular. Simply stated, Latter-day Saints have particularly strong reasons to express loyalty to their local governments, and the obligation to obey the law expresses that loyalty. Now, Latter-day Saints have long been the objects of political suspicion. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, received revelations, but he was not a mystic. He never um, retreats into ineffability or mystical experience. In his revelations, God says things, um, hundreds of pages of specific discursive um, uh, revelation, and oftentimes God commands things. Um, this freaked people out early on. Um, so, uh, Fear of the political power inherent of this notion of revelation was a persistent theme in Mormon history. The mobs that kicked the saints out of Missouri and Illinois were all motivated to a greater or lesser extent by the fear of the political power of the Latter-day Saints. And this suspicion of Mormon revelation has not um, diminished. So during Mitt Romney's run for the presidency, um, uh, Damon Linker wrote in the um, uh, New Republic, as long as the LDS Church continues to insist that its leaders serve as direct conduit from God, a God whose ways are to a considerable extent inscrutable to human reason, Mormonism will remain a theologically unstable and thus politically perilous religion. So Latter-day Saints um, face another kind of suspicion, and that is the expansion of the church after World War II um, uh, was marked by an association of the church overseas with America. And so oftentimes, anti-Americanism was directed towards the Latter-day Saints, who were seen as a sort of thorn, threat, or incursion into societies. So this was manifested by um, uh, the, the bombing and murdering of, Latter uh, bombing of LDS chapels and murdering of missionaries in the 1980s in Latin America. In Nicaragua, uh, all of the church's operations were shut down by the Sandinistas. In Ghana, uh, the church was expelled by uh, the government in the early 1990s. Uh, and more recently, the church is subject to chronic legal Legal harassment, for example, in Russia, uh, where it's seen as um, a, a degenerate foreign uh, religion. So Latter-day Saints increasingly, the, the ordinary Latter-day Saint, the core case of, of Latter-day Saints are not Mormons in Utah. It's not Mormons in the Internet and West or even Mormons in the United States. It's Mormons who are a tiny minority in a society in which they have little or no political power and are oftentimes viewed with great political suspicion. So to allay those suspicions, the church has consistently emphasized the duty of Latter-day Saints to be good citizens and to express loyalty to 
the uh, political regimes under which they live. And the way in which they express that loyalty is by obeying the law. So notice, this has exactly the same conceptual structure as Plato's argument in the Crito. You have an obligation to express loyalty. The way you express that loyalty is through uh, obedience to the law. Okay. Now, um, this particular kind of expressive argument uh, has sort of two interesting features uh, philosophically uh, for a legal theorist. The first is that expressive arguments are oftentimes subject to the criticism of, well, if I've got an obligation to express an attitude like uh, gratitude towards Athens, why do I express that through legal obligation? Why couldn't I like, write a poem praising a um, uh, Athens instead? So because Latter-day Saints are subject to the suspicion that they are going to undermine or disobey the law, uh, and you want to express civic loyalty, um, expressing that through legal obedience is a particularly powerful way of expressing that civic loyalty in a way that responds to the concerns of Latter-day Saint antinomianism. As long as Latter-day Saints continue to obey the law, you literally can't doubt their statement that we are obeying the law. Right, so um, uh, it, it, it responds to that objection. The odd thing about the expressive argument is that the, scope, the force of one's obligation to obey the law diminishes as legal systems are increasingly just and legitimate. So if we think of a just legal system as one where religious minorities are not subject to persecution, then if um, um, we have a just legal system, the reasons behind the expressed obligation to obey the law uh, diminish. Um, and so I think you actually see this in the United States. A, a great place of this is the church's reaction to illegal immigration. So a lot of ultra-conservative Mormons want to lean on the idea of obligation to obey the law means that illegal immigrants um, are doing bad things. Um, the church has actually not taken that position. Uh, it's been uh, quite measured in um, uh, uh, advocating um, uh, moderate approaches to immigration, and in practice, the church essentially is utterly uninterested in the immigration status of its members. Uh, so those uh, un undocumented immigrants in the United States who are in violation of American law um, are routinely called to be ecclesiastical leaders or missionaries or something like that. And that would make sense, right? So the, the, the uh, um, obligation to obey the law is weaker in the United States because the church is not subject to persecution in the United States. Now, the ironic force of the expressive argument is it becomes stronger the less legitimate the legal system is. And the church over its history has counseled legal obedience to really odious regimes, like um, the German Democratic Republic under Eric Honecker, or Chile under Augusto Pinochet when the death squads are pulling people off the street and murdering them. Um, and so you have this situation, right, in which um, um, the obligation to obey the law ironically um, to the extent that it rests on this peculiarly Latter-day Saint uh, basis becomes stronger when the legal regime is more odious. And that can lead to some very heartbreaking and difficult um, uh, situations. So in conclusion, I think we've got three strands of Latter-day Saint thinking about legal obligation. We have essentially a Protestant um, uh, version of legal obligation that says, sees a law as an instrument of God and we should obey the law because it's God's instrument. We have an a, a anarchist uh, view of law, a philosophically anarchist view of law, which is law has no inherent authority because it's a usurpation of God's authority. And then we have this modern uh, expressive um, obligation to um, uh, obey the law. And I am out of time and we'll leave it there. Thank you very much to our presenters. Um, we have uh, time for questions. We want to wrap up at uh, 11.30, I believe. So we have about, depending on if you're looking at that clock or mine, that's 10 minutes. This one's more like 12 minutes. Yeah, so thank you very much to the presenters. I thought these were really excellent uh, papers. I was uh, interested by a kind of overlap between uh, Nate Oman's presentation and the uh, presentation on amicus briefs. So the interesting, one of the interesting thing about the presentation on amicus briefs was the chart that shows everything fitting into church autonomy, right? So this is a really fundamental notion. And then my question is, how does this connect up with the three uh, types of re response? It seemed to me that in a certain way, it ties into the middle 
uh, what you characterize at the end as the anarchic uh, approach, but, but I think it's, I'm not sure that it's really fairly fair to call it anarchy because it's really very much uh, sort of a notion that there is very much an ordered kind of existence that the religious communities have that shouldn't be interfered with, and that's not necessarily a claim for anarchy in general. So I'd just be interested in how you connect those ideas. Um, so, um, first, when I say anarchy, I, I don't mean chaos, right? I mean philosophical anarchy. So philosophical anarchy is a, has a specific meaning, right? And the specific meaning is just that the fact that something is a legal rule, the fact of its legality gives you no moral reason to do whatever it is that the rule commands, right? So that's what philosophical anarcho, anarchism uh, means. Um, so I, I do think that the church's current um, um, concern with church autonomy as a, as a sort of central concern, um, I once co-authored a paper with Cole Durham making this argument. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I think that's right. And, and one way I think of, of thinking about uh, the church's current position is a sort of tamed version of John Taylor's position. Um, I do want to, just in the interests of um, keeping open uh, the possibilities within Mormon thought and maintaining um, sort of historical honesty and understanding, I do want to I, I, I do want to insist, right, that Taylor is actually making a really radical claim, right, that uh, uh, the only valid uh, and legitimate human government is one that claims uh, revealed authority from God. Like, I think he's pretty clearly making that claim. So the tamed version of that is something much more like um, a sort of legal pluralism, something um, that uh, a lot of people have argued, right, that there's a sort of um, sphere of the church and uh, its institution where it ought to be able to claim sovereignty, and then that's nested within a broader um, uh, notion of um, of sovereignty, and I, I do think there's there's um, historical and intellectual relationships of that in the anarchist position, but I, I do think they're distinct, um, and I do think that that more modern position is also um, motivated in large part by a sense of vulnerability, right, um, and trying to figure out how it is that Latter Day Saints carve out a space when um, in a world where they feel vulnerable. <laughs> 